I see the figures the other day, there's only one third left of those that went to Korea out of 17,000. And, uh, but they're fast going the way the Second World War ones are going. So when you wake up in the morning, you think, good, I've, I'm here, it's time. The first day I got to Korea, we got off the aircraft into the truck and we left to go up to the airbase and we're crossing the Han River. Next to the road bridge is a bombed out railway bridge and I said to the driver, what's them three bodies hanging there? And he said, don't worry about them, he said they're not going to give anybody any trouble anymore. I said to him, when do they take them down? He said, they don't, they let them rot and fall into the river. Well, later on in the winter, when everything was frozen over, I just happened to say to somebody one day in the mess, because they had piles of water in the mess, I said, where do they get this water from when everything's frozen over? They said, out of the river, they cut it out in blocks. And I thought, well, I hope it's upstream from what I see. <laughs> First of all, we'd have to belt up all the ammunition into long lengths to fit in the ammo bins on the aircraft, on the Meteor aircraft, 20 millimetres. And then we'd have to make up all the rockets to fit under the wings. And when I got there in October 52, they discovered they had a shipment. The rockets were all Second World War, for 45, 44 manufacture and the fins, because they were fitted onto the highest speed meteor jet, the fins were pulling away from the spot welds. And I think the first week I was there, we had to drill two holes in each fin and put rivets in them. And uh, that was a flat out job to get them, keep them up. And later on, I moved down to assembling the rockets and we had napalm rockets. They would have been the only ones in the world. They were designed and manufactured uh, in Japan. And the Japanese made them, welded them up. They were only sheet metal. And the nose, they, we screwed in a phosphorus grenade to ignite them on impact. And uh, when we get the 44 gallon drums of napalm would be collected from um, Inchon by truck and uh, brought back. Pouring that stuff out was a bit hazardous and uh, filling the heads up and screwing the phosphorus grenades in wasn't the cleverest of ideas and in the mine you'd think to yourself, if I drop this, <laughs> the world might go up. And in the winter, of course, it was worse. There was a lot of blood spilled on the airfield and uh, in the early days. Some of the blokes used to get upset with one another. We, I remember one lunch hour, we, there was two blokes going to have a punch up next to the wire on the brown perimeter. So we all gathered around to watch like good Aussies. Then the Yankee patrol pulled up with the guard dogs on the Jeep and a point, point .5 machine gun on the back and their own Tommy guns. Told us to break it up. Well, the Aussies told them where to go <laughs> and kept it going. And they copped their weapons and their dogs started barking. And the next thing I know, a couple of blokes appeared with <laughs> Aussies with their rifles and they, having a bit of a standoff. And I thought, this is not gonna be good. I started backing away. Anyway, one of a couple of our officers come over and told them, ordered them all away, out. Yeah, at times there was a lot of tension, a lot of tension. I finished up in hospital in Japan myself. I got a dose of pneumonia and uh, uh, they shipped me down to Seoul to be evacuated the next day. And I'm in the bed there with me big jug of juice. 
And it's the oil he's given me all the time to give me temperature down. Well, the walking wounded have been out on the town for half a day and they come back and one lot had a big bottle of boost gin and they knew they were going to get in trouble bringing that inside the hospital. So they poured it into my juice. And by the time I got on that plane, I was, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. I finished me six years at, and finished it at Lebanon. I was married by then. And uh, when I got out, I went as, uh, did a, uh, a fitter's exam and got me fitter's ticket and went to the harvester as a uh, bench tool maker. Uh, six years there and I finished up at the Ford Motor Company as a tool maker for 27 years until I retired crook. Um, it all caught up with me, as the psycho said. And then they said, well, you've been having all these turns, we'll classify you as unworkable and made me a TPI disabled veteran at the age of 58. Since then, I took up work with the RSL and, and the TPI Association. Yeah, we went back three years ago on a return trip, me and the wife, and there was about six couples from Geelong. Uh, that cemetery, it was a beautiful place, if you can call a cemetery a beautiful place. Well, what struck me, not so much as a why, I suppose I wanted to see how the place had really developed. And uh, I had thoughts of being on the airfield again, but it's turned into a international um, airport now. And, there's nothing there to, for memories. It's all, all gone, they said. And, uh, but the place itself is so modern, it's unbelievable. When we left it, I think it was 80% rubble. Everywhere we went, they welcomed us. And when you looked at the city and walked down the street, you, you feel good. <laughs>